Welcome everyone and thank you all for being here for the fifth in the series of the Ask the Pet Food Pro Chats. This series is brought to you by Pet Food Forum 2021 and the editors of Pet Food Industry, the magazine and digital content provider with decades of providing the market with pet food expertise. I'm Debbie Phillips Donaldson, the Editor-in-Chief of Pet Food Industry and Pet Food Forum, and I'm going to be moderating the discussion today. Um, Ask the Pet Food Pro is a great opportunity to reach out to indus an industry expert, ask the questions that are most on your mind, or just listen to your peers while gathering details to help you and your company provide quality pet food and treats. Today's chat is about the total cost of ownership of pet food production lines, generously supported by Waldner North America, so thank you to Waldner. And our expert today is Julian Stouffer, CEO of Waldner. So thank you and welcome, welcome Julian. Um, we, are, we got a few questions submitted beforehand. Thanks to everyone for those. And please feel free to submit your questions now in the chat box. We'll get to as many questions as we can in the time allowed, and we'll start that very soon. But first we're going to have Julian set the stage for the discussion today. Um, Julian, can you please provide an overview of the total cost of ownership concept and why it's so important to pet food production? Hi, Debbie. Uh, yes, good morning. Uh, thanks for that brief introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm Julian Stauffer, the CEO of Waldner North America, and it's really great to be here providing my team's insights. I'm sorry, I'm going to, I'm going to mute. Okay. Uh, sorry, Julian, I, I muted, remuted everyone. So if you're going to, you may have to unmute. Sorry about that. No problem. And I assume that's probably going to happen a few more times. So we'll, <laughs> we'll just roll with it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so I'm excited to be here to talk about my experience, my team's experience with pet food production lines and, you know, how the total cost of ownership applies to it. You know, over the last 10 years, we've had, you know, a lot of effective projects and then there have been some ineffective projects. What is an effective project? An effective project is, you know, where uh, the expectations, the desired outcomes of the customer and of the supplier are all set at, at the front end of the project and the project meets, you know, a reasonable timeline and it's executed as such. And an ineffective project, it, you know, you can imagine what an ineffective project might be. Uh, it would be something where uh, the packaging materials are not quite ready uh, but the packaging machine is ordered. Um, so then the packaging materials are showing up uh, at, the, at the machine manufacturer for FAT, but it's really the first time seeing them. Uh, so getting these schedules aligned, uh, getting the projects, the information, the team members aligned to, uh, you know, eff effectively plan out the projects is, is critically important. And, you know, when you talk about an ineffective project, uh, it has a really deep impact on the total cost of ownership. So we're gonna go into, you know, good examples and uh, let's say ineffective examples of projects that we've experienced and, you know, how, Thinking about the total cost of ownership on the front end can help you plan for these projects and, uh, you know, avoid the pitfalls. And, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the pitfalls today, hopefully, in, in the questions that come. Um, yeah, so Debbie, I will uh, throw it back to you uh, for the first question. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so I'm assuming that when you talk about planning uh, at, before you, you know, at the, at the beginning of a project, a, a, a production project, you're talking about some startup costs. You know, are, are there some basic startup costs that you've seen that usually are not accounted for and should be? Yeah, so startup costs, great question. Um, you know, when it comes to startup costs, 
uh, we can think about this in, in two different ways. So it's like the daily production startup costs, or you could think of it as the startup costs of, of a new project. You know, what are the things to consider when you have a production line already, but now you're trying to start up something new on the production line. So uh, startup costs on, the, on the, you know, a, a daily basis is, you know, you're, you're starting up each of the lines, you're starting up your extruder, you're starting up uh, your kitchen, you're starting up your packaging machine, your hydrostat, your retorts, and, and there is, you know, there's a lot of waiting time. Those are costs that are, that are not necessarily factored in. Um, uh, scheduling everything such that the different pieces of equipment are uh, aligned, starting up in, in a certain sequence such that you can, uh, so, that, so that you can avoid the waiting time. So you, you've planned in, that your batching process takes a certain amount of time. You've planned in that your your hydrostat takes a certain amount of time to start up, or that your packaging machine takes a certain amount of time to uh, prep itself for that first package sample running through it. Uh, you you have packaging loss or product loss in in all of this uh, when you're creating your batch of product out of your extruder or out of your kitchen. You know, you're testing that product to make sure that it's producing the product the way you want it to be produced. So there's some product waste there that might not be factored in, but it should be factored into the total cost of ownership because you're you're throwing that product away. Um, when you're starting up your packaging machine, there are cups or pouches or bags that, you know, get get wasted. They go off the end of the line. Nothing was filled in them, and there's a cost to that. Uh, and then, you know, when it comes to starting up a new project, uh, you have an existing production line. There are, uh, you know, maybe you need change parts for this new product. So you're now doing a 75 millimeter cup instead of a 90 millimeter cup. So you need change parts for that package format. But then uh, installing that package format or preparing the product on the, the front end and knowing how that product runs through your retort or sterilization process or how it fills in a, a pet food bag differently than your other products. So th there's a lot of uh, costs or testing that occur or, or start up and making sure that your equipment is running properly with a new product that might not be factored in when someone is, is scheduling a project and they say, hey, we have this great new idea, this new package, we bought all the, the components and now they're all on site, now we're just expected to run. It just, it's gonna work. And that's not necessarily the case. It, it takes a few weeks or it might take a month to get everything aligned from the kitchen process to the packaging process to the downstream uh, equipment. How much of this, um, if it's a new product, product and project especially, how much of that can people you know, know and plan for? Is that where working with suppliers is a, is a helps in terms of knowing some of those? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I believe that the suppliers on uh, the packaging side, they know that their, their packages have to be tested in the equipment. Mm -hmm. They can probably give some good timelines for how, how much time is expected to test that package on the line and make sure that it is running properly, it's handled properly, it's sealed properly. Um, you know, and generally they have a good sense of uh, the application and whether something is, you know, a normal application or whether it's outside the box. So they can give 
uh, so they can give different timelines for different types of, of packaging. But then also like equipment suppliers uh, like Waldner, we have a good sense for uh, installing new format parts. It should take probably one to two weeks to get those format parts on the machine and properly commissioned. Uh, and, you know, I say that along the lines of the, the product has already been tested. So the, the, the upfront stuff on the kitchen side is, is ready to go. I say that also with the downstream stuff is Patrick, tested and ready to go. The so powder. Powder. Do you they have, have the adequate tailwind to just... Am I, yep. They have, uh, they've already done their retour testing. Uh, so with the up, uh, the front end side and the back end side already have been tested and, you know, knowing that things are operational, it would take one to two weeks to make sure that the packaging machine is uh, commissioned properly. So, uh, yeah, you know, relying on your suppliers to help with the timelines uh, of starting up a new product, uh, starting up a new package uh, can help with the, you know, harnessing the startup costs a little bit better. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, someone asked a question just now or, or made a comment that with the current disruptions in supply chains, you know, that's, that's you know, definitely uh, causing some problems with ingredients. And I think I've heard, you know, some other uh, raw materials, like for example, for a while it was aluminum for cans. Um, I don't know if that's still the case, but I mean, is there, do you have any, any I think to add along those lines and in an environment like now where things are still kind of volatile, um, you know, are there costs or, or things to consider that people may not be thinking of? Yeah, you know, uh, I, I think on the material cost side, on raw ingredients cost side, you know, it's always better to overestimate, put, put higher costs on, on the materials, put, put higher costs on raw materials. And then when you're actually producing, you know, and you got those materials in and you're actually producing it, uh, and, and then you, you see the real costs of it, you're ahead of the game. Um, you know, and, and speaking to, to the su supply chain issues, like uh, parts for equipment, parts, you gotta have parts on site to make sure that your production line isn't down. Because if you have a highly automated production line and then, you know, one thing's down because you didn't stock parts and now your whole line is down. Uh, that can be really problematic. And it's not, it's not the cost of the operation that is then problematic from that perspective. What's the major cost there is the lost revenue opportunity. The lost revenue opportunity from a down production line is so much more impactful than the cost of having that production line down. That, that makes sense. That makes sense. And right now with pet food, the pet food market being as strong as it is, you don't want to lose out on an opportunity to get your pet food out there <laughs> or treats. Um, what we've so you've talked somewhat about startup costs, and I think we've sort of we're talking about new projects and, and um, lines. What about if you have a legacy plant? Um, you know, if you're trying to make that more efficient, um, what the, the question is, what is the impact on production costs of trying to efficiently produce new generation products in a legacy facility that have just added on equipment to create a new production line? Yeah, so. <clears throat> A legacy, a legacy facility, and we're trying to do a new product in there. So, uh, I would say that the first thing that you have to think about is 
Okay, so which which way can I take this? I can take this as we're doing a new product, but we want to use our existing production line. But so we might need to add a new piece of equipment in that production line in order to have this legacy plant produce this new product, right? Uh, but just tacking on a new piece of equipment in there isn't necessarily going to work. You have to think about the upstream equipment and the downstream equipment and how that piece of equipment impacts those upstream processes and downstream processes. And if you have, uh, you want to do this new product and you still want to do your legacy products, uh, how does that play in? You might you might say, hey, now we need to do a whole new production line in this legacy plant. Or we're factoring in this piece of equipment, bolting it onto a line, and part of the time we're running this new product and part of the time we're running this, this older product. Uh, so, you know, when it comes to bolting on a, a piece of equipment in a production line, uh, you want to make sure that your upstream capacity, you're able to produce enough product that you can run it on the new line. And then when you're done running that product, you know, you can switch over to, to the old line and there isn't some kind of bottleneck or constraint that holds up your process. Uh, and then also with, with the new line, if, if you're adding it in, you want to make sure that your downstream processes are are up to speed, that they're up to snuff, that they can handle the the product throughput that's coming down to it. Okay. Um, let's talk about some some individual parts of the line or individual types of equipment. Um, so there was one about. Uh, milling loss. How should expected milling loss be factored into total cost of ownership? Interesting. Um, milling loss. So I am not an expert on uh, milling processes, right? But when you say milling loss, I immediately think of, of quality. Like we've got some kind of scrap, there's a scrap rate where we've lost product here. Uh, so that makes me think of uh, overall equipment effectiveness. So overall equipment effectiveness is uh, a way to measure a production line, uh, the efficiency of a production line, right? Overall equipment effectiveness is an equation that checks performance, availability, and quality. So performance is, uh, you know, what is the actual run rate of the equipment versus the expected run rate of the equipment. Availability is the planned production time measured against the, uh, sorry, it's the actual production time measured against the planned production time. And then quality is the amount of good product versus the total product it could produce or the total product it did produce. So from a milling loss perspective, how to, how to measure that, I would think uh, you, you use the OEE equation and uh, you know, you're, you're measuring for your equipment effectiveness, but the quality part of it is gonna me measure your, your scrap rate. So it's like the total, uh, milled product produced measured against the uh, total input of product. Okay. Um, well, and, and so moving down the line a little bit, um, we've had a question come in about extruders. This is a uh, Someone wanted to know what are, what's recommended. Uh, I don't think that's the, the purpose of the talk today is to recommend specific types uh, or, or manufacturers of a specific equipment. But um, with the same, I'm assuming that the same approach would work in um, any other parts of equipment on the line in terms of evaluating um, 
the, the different parameters you just talked about, the quality and the performance. Um, and then I would imagine that that's the kind of, if you're looking for a new piece of equipment such as an extruder, that's the kind of thing that a, an extruder manufacturer should be able to provide. Correct? Yeah. So overall equipment effectiveness can be used on each piece of equipment in your production line. So from the front end to the back end. And then, you know, get good at that first, right? Get good at measuring the overall equipment effectiveness of each piece of the production line. And then you can actually have an overall equipment effectiveness of your whole production line by an OEE is multiplying performance times availability times quality. And these are percentages. And then when you're measuring each piece of equipment and then you're trying to get the OEE of a whole production line, it's multiplying the OEEs of each piece of equipment on that production line. So, you know, you have, you have one bad piece of equipment on your production line, your OEE for the whole line is, is way down. Uh, a world-class manufacturing environment has an OEE of 85%. And... Think about a production line. Think about how many pieces of equipment you have in a single production line. Uh, maybe it's 10, maybe it's 15 different pieces of equipment that are working together, um, going from you know, your, your milling process all the way down to palletizing. Um, you know, so you're multiplying each of those different OEs together, you might be operating at a 50, 60, 70% OEE. And the objective here with total cost of ownership going forward would be to try to elevate that OEE to 85% or higher. And, you know, with total cost of ownership, you're looking at, you're looking at the upfront investment cost of a piece of equipment and factoring in the operating expenses of that piece of equipment, which, you know, it factors in a whole bunch of stuff and different companies might approach it slightly differently. They, uh, depending on how they handle their finances, they might put in other things uh, into the total cost of ownership or operating expenses of that line versus other companies don't. Um, so, you know, OEE, uh, for an, uh, for a production line, uh, can be used for each piece of equipment. And then as you get good at that, you want to use it across your whole production line. And you, as you buy pieces of, of equipment going forward, you want to make sure that you hold your suppliers accountable for that OEE uh, and you want them to have them promise an OEE to you so that you can deliver in your plant across your whole production line a certain OEE. And, you know, it's a calculation. It's, it's very measurable. Right. Um, and we've had a, a question come in about how to start measuring the line production costs. I think you've gone over the bit, just to reiterate, so you start with one piece of equipment or one part of the line, and it's the expected um, output versus what you're actually getting. It's the expected um, quality versus what you're getting. If you could, if you could yeah, uh, give that, yeah, I'll, give that. I'll reiterate it, sure. sure. Um, so OEE, and by the way, you can go to OEE.com. It's a, a website where you can find out all about overall equipment effectiveness. So uh, OEE is performance times availability times quality. Performance is the current run rate of the equipment measured against the expected run rate of the equipment. So if you're running, uh, I'm in packaging machinery. So if we're running a machine uh, at 350 cups per minute, but it's supposed to run at 400 cups per minute, you're running it at 80, 88%. So your performance is 88%. Uh, your availability is your 
uh, actual uptime of the equipment against, or sorry, it's the actual production time of the equipment measured against the planned production time of the equipment. So if, if the machine is down because something broke or if the machine went down because yeah, a cup is missing, that impacts the actual production time because the machine's not producing, it stopped. Uh, so if, if you operate for eight hours, but the machine actually was only running for seven hours, then you're again operating at about 85%. So you have your performance at 88, your availability is at 85, and then your quality is, okay, we produced uh, 350 cups, but actually 20 of them had bad seals. So you're only producing 330 cups out of uh, 350. So then what's that quality percentage? It's uh, just off the top of my head, it's maybe what, 97% or something like that. But uh, you multiply those uh, three numbers together and then you get a percentage that is uh, in the 50s or 60s. Um, so, so that's how you go ahead and you calculate OEE. And from... From Waldner's perspective, to talk about you know what we expect out of our equipment is ninety five percent overall equipment effectiveness, and that means that our once our machine is commissioned, we should be operating uh, from a performance standpoint at ninety nine percent when we are wow. yeah and when we're doing. Uh, our machine should always be available. So when you have planned production time, that our machine should be running. And if it's it's not running, uh, okay, maybe something broke on the machine, but we want our customers to do the proper preventive maintenance so that things aren't breaking. We don't want to be uh, in run to failure mode. We want to do proper PMs on our equipment such that we prevent the breakage, such that we prevent the unplanned downtimes during a production process. Uh, so our goal is that, again, on the availability, we're above 99%, and then quality is utmost. 99.99% uh, is, is our quality standard that we have. Um, you know, we, we commit to customers where, you know, we we want to deliver uh you know quality rates of like one leaker in, in 20,000 cups uh you know that's that's a minimum um i you know it depends on the applications too but it's like we hold ourselves to a very high standard and so when you multiply those three numbers together you have uh, overall equipment effectiveness that's above 95% and, and that's what we want to achieve as, as a company. And then when you uh, take upstream equipment and downstream equipment and you put these things together, I mean, we need to have high quality equipment at the end of our Waldner line and high quality equipment at the front end of our Waldner line. Otherwise, uh, it doesn't really help to have a great Waldner machine and, and then the rest of your line uh, has poor, poor efficiencies. And so then your line efficiency is down at 50, 60%. So we want, uh, we want to support and, and make sure that the downstream equipment is also uh, above, at that nine, above 95%. Uh, we wanna make sure that our customers, we wanna help them elevate the overall equipment, equipment effectiveness of their line. Okay, that sounds great. Um, and thank you to the person who put the website address for oe.com in the chat box for everyone to access. So um, we'll continue to move down the production line to packaging, which is, you've been talking about that a lot because that's a Waldner specialty. 
what do what does someone need to think about from a total cost of ownership perspective when it comes to the packaging or packaging line? Yeah. So when it comes to the packaging or packaging line, total cost of ownership, man, there are so many ways in, in which uh, we impact total cost of ownership. I mean, it is where the product and the package come together, right? So, uh, you know, we're sealing, we're sealing a lid on a cup. Uh, the, the products inside. We need to make sure that that product makes it to the end consumer. So from a total cost of ownership perspective, if that cup is not sealed well, you're going to have a lot of downstream manual inspection, checking cups, sorting cups. That's, that's a disaster when it comes to uh, total cost of ownership. You just have uh, tons of money thrown away for cup inspection when your process should be sealing the cups properly. Uh, so, and that's, that's the difference between a high quality piece of equipment and a, a piece of equipment that costs 20% less. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that's one angle to take. And then another angle to take is like, uh, from a packaging perspective, you know, form fill seal versus fill seal. If you're doing bags and you're doing form fill seal, you know, you might say that the material cost per pouch is less than buying a preformed bag. However, in your plant, you have to have a higher level of manual labor. Your, your labor costs are higher because you have to have you have to have engineers you have to have line techs that know what they're doing when it comes to form fill seal they have to be able to set up that machine each and every day to run those pouches the right way and there are always setup costs when it comes to form fill seal equipment uh, so when it comes to total cost of ownership fill seal and form fill seal you know there are there are clear differences on on the packaging side of things where um, it, it there are there are hidden costs. You you say I'm buying preformed bags and they they cost so much more, but on the form fill seal side, there are these other labor costs or startup costs, waste costs that occur. Um, that make it more costly than just buying a more expensive bag. Also, uh, the equipment pricing on a form fill seal is, is much more than on a pre-made bag. So there are, there are different price points for equipment. There are different price points for packaging. Uh, there are different price points for labor. And this is all in the packaging uh, line or the packaging materials. Uh, the other thing to think about is like the flexibility on, on the packaging side. Uh, being able to fill and seal multiple formats on the same machine. How quickly can you change over from one package format to another package format? Uh, you know, do you have a piece of equipment that can do a 75 millimeter cup and a 90 millimeter cup and this, the changeover uh, from one cup size to another cup size is, you know, just a matter of changing the program in the HMI uh, because inside the machine, you've already built all the components to make it a flexible machine that it can do both formats uh, and, and then you have a, a quick changeover or you have packaging, uh, you have a 75 millimeter cup and the, the way that you increase your volume on your cup is you just increase the depth. So then you don't actually have to change over anything on your machine. You're just changing out the package and you're changing something on the HMI to, to do a higher fill volume. Um, so, you know, these are some of the uh, things to 
think about when looking at total cost of ownership on the packaging line or for packaging materials? Lots of things to think about. <laughs> um, and uh, we'll, we'll kind of shift a little bit here. And we talked somewhat earlier in the discussion about the current supply chain disruptions. Um, you know, there's other things that have happened. We know all know that the pandemic really made um, more consumers buy online, including their pet food. That's really accelerated a lot, but there's still some people, you know, there's still evidence of people buying in stores. So how does, how did changes like that in the marketplace impact how pet food producers operate and uh, then their total cost of ownership? Yeah. Wow. That's a, that's a great question because it's so relevant for, for today. Um, when you think about how we operate as, as manufacturers, we are, we have a package, we, we fill and seal it. We put it downstream. We put it in a box, we put it on a pallet, we send it to a warehouse. And then that's going to brick and mortar. Uh, but today, now consumers want it delivered to their house. So it's, you know, you can't use the same process to efficiently deliver the stuff to someone's house. Um, you kind of, you have to change your downstream. Uh, and what some companies are doing is what's called. Uh, the concept is, is SIOC, uh, it's ship in own container. And, you know, this concept is when I've got the package, I've got my 24 pound bag of pet food, it's filled and sealed. And now instead of going downstream to the palletizer, it's coming off the line and being picked and placed into a box. It's being picked and placed into an Amazon box or a Chewy box. And so you're, you're literally changing. This is one of those bolt-on projects where part of the line, you, you know, part of the day you might run the line such that you're loading a pallet and, and you're doing your normal process. And then part of the day you're saying, okay, we also need to, tend to the e-commerce so we've got to instead of sending these bags to the palletizer we're going to divert this bag to a new machine where we're picking and placing it into a box um and and so this idea that we have to change how we're thinking about warehousing and uh you know where does that box end up going and 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 tracking all these boxes with individual bags, uh, they're stored on the shelf, they're ready to go for whatever consumers are ready to buy it. Um, it it's, it's a complex process downstream that would have, to, that has to be updated and it's costly. Um, so that, that has a huge impact. And then also, you know, the same applies on a can line or a cup line or a small pouch line. Uh, these products get loaded into individual cases, right? Uh, but then you have to think these packages have to survive this different supply chain method. So they're now going in a UPS truck. They're now getting tossed around a little bit more. They're now getting, uh, so, so the packaging inside may have to change because uh, it might break. You might break the lid on the cup. You might break the pouch. And then that product inside is, is no longer good. Um, so you, you might have to think about how, which products you're selling in e-commerce. So uh, that then changes, that might change your whole production line. If you're saying we need to, instead of doing cans, we need to do this type of package. And then that might also change your, your fill volumes that you're filling into the package. Uh, it, it, it brings up a lot of questions that could change your whole way in which you're processing. Definitely, definitely. Um, there was a part of that question related to 
sustainability. Um, we haven't really talked much about that, but you know, besides consumers demanding sustainability more, I think more companies are paying are paying attention to it. Um, how does that it, it, for most companies is that something to factor into the cost total cost of ownership? Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you're if you're shipping a whole bunch of cans, it's more weight than shipping cups or pouches. Um, you know, but so I, I think that companies will have to think about that sustainability uh, message in terms of carbon emissions, because it, when you when you think about it, we're not just sending one truck with a, a boatload of pallets to a warehouse or to a brick and mortar. We're now sending hundreds of trucks, UPS trucks with individual packages. And so that e-commerce impact from a sustainability standpoint, it's, it could, it's, well, it's a pretty bleak it's, picture. Yeah, it's huge. I think it's huge too, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You, know, um, you also have you also have the consumers that right. will then drive to the brick and mortar. So it's uh, you, so you think about it to the opposite way: a FedEx truck or a UPS truck uh, delivering pet food products to a bunch of different houses. Okay, it's one truck, and some people aren't driving out. Uh, th there's that point of view as well. Right. Okay. Um, You've touched a little bit on inspection, um, testing, you know, in terms of the quality of the product coming off different parts of the, of the line. Um, how does, how do different types of testing and inspection factor into, into total cost of ownership? I mean, talking about even like raw materials coming into your facility and testing those before they ever are used all the way down through the line. Yeah. So, you know, testing is an important part of, uh, total cost of ownership, it is, uh, again, it plays into this quality uh, role of the OEE equation. Um, you know, whether you're testing the, the raw ingredients or the product that you're making itself or the packaging or, you know, the load of a pallet, like all this testing that occurs along a production line to make sure that that production line is running properly should definitely be factored into the total cost of ownership of that production line. Um, you know, my experience or specialty is the testing of packaging. So package integrity, seal integrity. Uh, again, you know, that seal integrity is, is so critical to that to consumers you don't want that package going to a consumer they've got an open pet food cup in their home that they didn't open themselves it's it's gross it's disgusting uh it's a it's a poor uh image for you know a big brand company um so you definitely want to implement testing to to prevent that kind of stuff but it can be it can be quite costly so uh, you know, whether, whether it's manual inspection where you're, where you're checking packaging or it's, you know, it's, it's offline testing, uh, these things definitely need to be factored into the total cost of ownership. And, uh, you know, they're really there not to catch the, the, the leakers. They're not there to do that because leakers will eventually get through. It, it will happen. Um, however, uh, th these inspection processes are more about making sure that your production line is under control. It's making sure that you're uh, producing the product that you want to produce. It's making sure that your uh, sealing station is heat sealing the packages properly or ultrasonically sealing the packages properly. It's making sure that your retort process is uh, effectively cooking that product. So uh, 
testing along the line is is critical and um obviously should be factored in total cost of ownership and it, you, there's always this uh negative mindset when it's coming to testing like oh like it's bad that quality has caught this stuff no it's it's good it, quality needs to be there to make sure that the production line is running properly okay um and i'm assuming that to account for those kinds of toss, costs, sorry, um, the approach would be as you recommend with the OEE equation is to take one piece of equipment and and get good at evaluating its its effectiveness and in, in OEE. So that would include those the test any testing related to that piece of equipment or part of the line. Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, we have had a couple of costs of other questions come in. I think this one. Um, one of them relates to our next subject. And so we'll get to that and then we'll, we'll dive into that question specifically. Um, so we've had a question, some questions come in about ancillary equipment. So things like odor control, pest control, um, airborne particulates and emissions, other parts of the process that may not be actually within the line. Um, how do you consider them in terms of total cost of ownership? Yeah, so... You know, I would apply these things when you're getting to a bigger picture of total cost of ownership. Uh, you know, first focus on the total cost of ownership of a piece of equipment and then of a production line. And, and you know, take the baby steps to do each of those processes correct first. And then you can get to the plant level. So like uh, you said, pest control or odor control. I mean, that's across the whole plant. So it's not just a specific production line. Um, and so then there, there are these ancillary costs that you can then uh, divide up along your production line. And, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can do it, but it's, it's more like the total cost of ownership of your plant. Uh, but I guess you could apply it to each production line as you refine your skill set around total cost of ownership. Okay. And, and as you mentioned earlier, that also has to do with just how your company may account for things. You know, some companies will account yeah. for all overhead, including staff costs within a production line, and some may keep that separate. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is a, a, a interesting question. Is there a processing operation or a piece of equipment in pet food processing plants that could be considered as a constraint or bottleneck that all other equipment needs to be sized around or planned around to, you know, to optimize your total cost of ownership? I love it. That's a great question. Um, you know, I like to think of the kitchen as the place that you want to base your production off of. Uh, that might be your extruder. That might be a, a cooking vessel for wet pet food product. Um, but, you know, it's the equipment that, where the bottleneck is, it's the equipment that you really don't want to turn off. Once you get an extruder running, you don't want to turn that off. And it, it's running well, let it run well, let it run for as long as you can. So you want to base all your other equipment around that piece of equipment that you want to be running the longest. Uh, so if your extruder is pumping out a certain tonnage of pet food product an hour, then you want your... Uh, processing equipment uh, for, for drying or for uh, preparing that food to be loaded into bags and, and palletized. You want all that equipment to be greater than the capacity of the extruder because it's going to pull from the extruder and the extruder will be constantly running. And, and hopefully, your downstream equipment is not uh, 
your, your downstream equipment is not less efficient than your extruder. So like you want your downstream equipment to, uh, to not hold up. You don't want your downstream equipment to break down. You want good quality downstream equipment. So it's constantly pulling that extruder so that uh, that valuable piece of equipment is constantly running and you don't have to shut it down because uh, you don't have more space to put the pet food because the, the line's backing up. So you want your packaging line to pull from the extruder. You want your palletizer to pull from the packaging line. And it, the same thing on wet pet food. Uh, you know, if you got a vessel that produces, you know, 4,000 pounds of product, uh, you want, and, and you have to pack that in a certain amount of time because it's hot product and it needs to be filled and retorted quickly. Right. You want, you want to base your whole production line off that vessel. So then the packaging machine is pulling the product within the hour because it has to be put into the retort in an hour you know um so generally i would focus on the kitchen as kind of like the heartbeat uh of your of your production line and kitchen again being the extruder or a vessel or where Whatever. the product is being right. made gotcha okay um this is, I think, an interesting question too. Can someone, does someone know of sources of drawings or sketches of a pet food plant line set up dry and wet? I do know that some equipment manufacturers have those available, at least on the, uh, for, the for extruders. Are you aware of any uh, more general source? To, to get, you know, how to set up a-, a Yeah, like, like a diagram of here are all the things in an extrusion line, here are all the things in a retort line. Yeah, I mean, uh, there, there are some uh, experts that I'm familiar with that, you know, they'll, they'll provide that information. Uh, if, if you talk to them, they'll get you that information. Uh, I don't know where it's just like available. You could probably Google it um, and get some information on, on layouts. I mean, network with colleagues. And I, I think you network with the right people. Uh, people are willing to share information and support each other because <laughs> we all have uh, mistakes that we've made in mm -hmm. starting up pet food production lines. And, you know, I don't think, <laughs> uh, I think people are willing to help each other out and help other people avoid making the same mistakes. Right. Okay. Yeah. So someone share that information. I yeah. Think. Someone, someone's uh, did a chat and, um, if I'm asked him to share it with everyone. So there are, there are, I know that some equipment manufacturers and I'm not going to name names just because I don't want to show any favoritism. I know a lot of equipment manufacturers have that, that those kinds of diagrams available. And I think, um, you know, in terms of like a, an academic program, I know like Kansas state that has a pet food processing program. They, ha I don't know if they're re readily available on um, the website for Kansas state and that, that program, but I know they have that kind of thing. So yeah, I think you're right. I think it's a matter of asking around. Um, we had a couple other questions come in related to um, specific things about the Waldner equipment. So I think for those folks, I'm going to get those to um, Julian privately so he can he and his team can address those with you after the fact. Um, otherwise, uh, I, I thought it'd be kind of fun and a little bit more lighthearted to end on um, talking about your painting. So if anyone watched the uh, promo video that Julian did, he mentioned his paintings and you can see them in the background of uh, his room where he's, he's uh, doing this call from. So we're gonna hear about Julian's paintings if that's okay with everyone. Yeah, so uh, my, you know, being an artist is, is runs in my family. Uh, my mom is an artist and her dad was an artist and I think her her dad's dad was also an artist. So it really like runs in the family. Um, so, you know, to, to get the stress out of the day, uh, I like to throw some paint against the wall sometimes or against the canvas. And uh, some of these pieces of art are uh, things that, you know, my mom did many years ago. 
and I, you know, I've, I found some pieces that, you know, for, for her, uh, were maybe junk or not really, let's call it incomplete. And then I've added my own touches to it. So, uh, you know, this one here on the, on the left, it was, it was just like a broken canvas with this, it was, it was ripped open and I kind of turned it into kind of like a bloody scene. Uh, I don't know. That's just kind of, uh, it was, it was fun to throw some red paint against it and make it feel like, uh, something has come alive. Um, and then there's a painting back there that is, uh, my mom's painting, the, the largest one here. Uh, yep, I'm, I'm not really doing a good job pointing with my finger, but, <laughs> um, you know, it, it's a, my mom's style is to, to put some artifacts on the painting or to, to make something real pop out of the painting. And so uh, that's her painting there. And, you know, I, I put my own touch on it. So you know, it, it's a nice combination of me and my mom. Um, and then th there's some artwork back here that is also my my children, uh, my my six year old and my three year old. They enjoy painting with me, so it's always always good fun. Um, so yeah, thanks thanks for asking that last question, Debbie. And you know, a, a final note from from my side. Uh, you know, we've we've talked a lot about different things to factor in TCO, total cost of ownership. And, you know, I like to leave everyone with this final note. You know, companies make an investment in equipment and they, they want to get a certain ROI out of it, right? When they're calculating their ROI, they're calculating off the investment price of the piece of equipment and what they really need to be doing. And, and some people do this, they factor in certain other costs into the ROI, but you really have to use total cost of ownership to really understand what the ROI is. Otherwise, what are you measuring? When you're measuring ROI, what are you really measuring? You're not really measuring the real ROI unless you're factoring in total cost of ownership. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, we've come to the top of the hour. Uh, Julian will get all the questions. So as I mentioned before, if someone didn't have their question answered, um, he and his team can follow up. Um, thank you very much to Julian. Thanks to all, all of you for participating. Thanks very much to Julian for the today's discussion and his insights and to Waldner for supporting today's chat. Julian will also be presenting a tech talk during Pepin Forum 2021 in a few weeks. Um, to learn more about that and other learning opportunities you can have at Pepin Forum, you can see the full agenda at petfoodforumevents.com. Um, Pet Food Forum is returning as an in-person conference and exhibition this year. And we will also have an on-demand version for people who are unable to travel, which unfortunately is still happening. So um, please check that out at petfoodforumevents.com and, um, and hope you will enjoy the rest of your day and evening. Uh, someone is asking if there's an, a, a webinar to avoid or webinar to download later. We will have a recording of this available to download soon. So thanks again to Julian and to Waldner and to everyone for your, for your participation today. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.